Hello and welcome to the Controller Talk podcast presented by Danfoss North America. Our goal is to bring you information about using Danfoss controls in the supermarket and warehouse industry, specifically in the U.S. and Canada. We're doing these twice a month for now. You can catch these podcasts wherever you get your podcasts, and it's also available through the Danfoss Ref Tools app. For the video version, check us out on the Danfoss North America YouTube page. Search for Controller Talk to see our video collection. I'm Dave Yoder, along with Chris Brown. So, Chris, we're in college basketball season now. <laughs> As you know, uh, I think uh, Maryland's still doing a little better than Penn State uh, when it comes to college basketball. Men's, that is. So, last and next to last, is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> well, not exactly. Uh, last I checked, Maryland was 13 and 10, and Penn State was 11 and 11. But number one, UConn, those guys are like 20 and 2, I think, right now. Yeah, we don't have March Madness too far away. Even if our teams aren't in it, it'll still be fun to <laughs> fun to watch. Right, right. For us, it'll be March sadness. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yes, yes. Uh, so I have another question here for you, Chris. Oh, geez. Um, I'm yeah. PTSD here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, every once in a while, I like to quote uh, comedian Dimitri Martin because he's he's pretty good. Um, so when is uh, when is I apologize and I'm sorry not the same thing? You're drawing a blank, aren't you? Now we get to stump Chris at the beginning and the end of the show. That's right. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> it's, it's for our amusement. <laughs> what do we got? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I apologize and I'm sorry are not the same when you're at a funeral. <laughs> I'll let you think about that one for a minute. We, we need the drummer guy in the background. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And the piped in audience applause. Yeah. 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 I agree. All right. Yeah. So... Um, we are going to talk about uh, something near and dear and relevant to our hearts, and that's uh, some CO2 startup uh, checklist options for people. Are we really 10 episodes in? We've really been. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't feel like 10 this year. That's okay. good. <laughs> <laughs> it's because we've been doing them so frequently or infrequently, depending <laughs> on how you look at it. But uh, yeah, 10 already. Good. That's right. Good, good. So uh, yeah. So we got to thinking a little bit about... Um, you know, everybody wants to do a startup a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's just, uh, <laughs> hey, do we have enough charge to start this baby? And they flip the switch and see what happens. And other guys are a little bit more methodical yeah. about that kind of thing. And um, so, yeah, what we found is that, um, yeah, I like your phrase, a million little things that can set you back uh, because there are a lot of things that, to check. So um, what we're going to offer today is... Um, uh, an option to uh, get yourself prepared for a CO2 startup because sometimes we have people there and sometimes we don't. Yeah. And um, if you get the million, million little <laughs> things out of the way, then uh, you have a better chance of getting things up and running on, on your time frame. There's definitely yeah. things you can yeah prepare for. You use the word prepare. I think that's the perfect word because if you knock out some of these things we're talking about here and have yourself ready for what you need walking into a job, it, it's going to prevent the chaos yeah. or more chaos than you need from occurring yep. once you're out there and you're, and you just scrambling, throwing your hands up, trying to figure out, is it me? Is it yeah. controller? Is it the rack? What's going on here? Yeah. And this can help prevent some of that. Right. Right. Because, uh, yeah, when it comes to CO2, it's, um, the controls are a big part of that. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, if the controls aren't set up right or ready to roll, then uh, you're not going to get the results you want. The guy, I mean, walking into this, a lot of times the pack controller is the first time for them. So if they don't know where to go to see information, what, what's my gas cooler pressure, what's my suction pressure, whatever it might be, yep. that just adds to the the misery and the stress. And so, I, I, yeah, again, having preparation and knowing where to go to find different pieces of information, that can definitely make life easier. Yep. Yep. So uh, we're going to run through kind of a list here of things that we thought of and... Um... And then uh, hopefully this will turn into something that uh, will allow people to be a little more prepared when they're uh, on a job and, you know, if you, at least uh, maybe a couple days from starting things. Mm-hmm. But um, one of the things that uh, would be that you want to have ready is um, does someone have a uh, updated copy of the service tool software and a printer cable so they can plug into the pack controller and, um, and a laptop, of course, um, that they can be prepared to be online with the pack controller so you can see exactly what's going on and you can make changes fairly quickly if you need to, uh, that sort of thing. 
And um, as far as the pack controller goes, then um, you want to check to see if the software version in the pack controller is up to date. Uh, we know that if you need to update it, you can use Service Tool software to do that. It's just basically pushing one file into the controller and you're done. Yep. Um, but um, sometimes, the, in I would say most times, the pack controller comes uh, already programmed. <laughs> but it doesn't always happen. Right. Yeah, it should be, but definitely yeah. instances where you might have to look at that still. <laughs> right. Yep. And if it's not already programmed, then you're going to have a, uh, a BCK or a backup file for the pack controller to load. And if that was written in a specific version, then you want to make sure that the pack controller's got the same version in it. So sometimes it could be older and then you got to upgrade it. And this was another one of those few minute videos that we'll have available in the not too distant future is exactly how to load a database in, how to do a software update. So okay. we can help step you through that. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, you want to know if the pack controller is already programmed or do you have to program them on site? Yeah. And then you can kind of switch gears from the pack controller and, and focus on the system manager too, because that, uh, we want that in order before we start everything up. Uh, is the software version up to date? And is that at the latest version? Uh, and so I, I think with our 800 A's guys that have experienced this or, or had to run through this already, software update process is a lot easier than what it's been historically that's for sure yeah so i to say it's not up to date and you have to do it it's it's really not that much pain it should be something that's pretty easy you can get through it within a few minutes and now you know what you're working with as far as the latest version uh access codes uh, yeah <laughs> make sure you have access and uh, the ability to get in there if that's something that you should have uh, so being able to log into the system managers it's going to be able to help you check other things when we talk about case controllers here in a few seconds but if you can't get into the system manager then uh you're behind the eight ball and you're talking about things like history for the pack controllers you're not going to know if that's set up or logging that type of thing so definitely during the startup phase i'd say at a minimum make sure that you you know if you have that capability of logging in from the end user that you know what your codes are and how to get in there uh io case controllers pack controllers all these things tie into the system managers today through modbus or echelon com loops um, for the most part so i yeah obviously you want to review them make sure everything's wired correctly we have the termination switches above the mod bus and lawn plugs those should be in the right state one for a single com loop into them off if you have duplicate or, or two com loops coming back to a single plug uh, the type of wire we, we've talked extensively with people on the phone about using windy city that windy city wire is the most common on the market but for Echelon 485 and Modbus, we're, we're talking about an EIA 485 rated cable. So, yeah, you don't want to use old thermostat wire or anything crazy you picked up off a truck for five bucks. That's true. Uh, look at the case controller side. Are they online with the system manager? So we know we have our network nodes portion of the system manager program where you can go in and see what's online and what's offline. There's good indicators on the home screen of the system manager. When things are offline, they'll be highlighted in red. Uh, so making sure your case controllers are online and, and programmed. A lot of times today, the case controller settings are uh, put in at the system manager level, and they just need to be downloaded to the case controllers. So just making sure you're familiar with that process. Uh, you're not overwriting with uh, specific settings that have been put in and overwriting factory defaults that might come with the case controller since that's not where the programming has been installed. And then the case controllers are a lot like pack controllers and, and system managers where there's different firmware versions. So if you see the word mismatch, I, I think we had talked about that some in season mm -hmm. one, if memory serves correctly. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it, it, one of the selections you have to make in the system managers is which version of case controller, specifically with the firmware taken into account you have. And so just looking all those things over to make sure once you do start the rack, you're not going to be scrambling to try to get something else straightened out. Uh, pack controller on the case controller side, still with pressure transducers. We don't want to <laughs> flood back. We, we know the risks you run there. So it takes extra time, but you're also not going to be chasing your tail later on if you go through and calibrate the sensors. Or at a bare minimum, I'd say at least give them a good glance over to make sure they're not reading completely out of range 
pressure transducers reading too high or too low, that can get you into a, a situation where either you're not pulling good case temp or you're flooding back to the compressors. Uh, and then there's a settings for your superheat, kind of sticking with that same theme where you limit min and max. Uh, people can dial this in to, to their own desire, I guess you could say, from one customer to the next. But I'd say across the board, a general starting point that we see with CO2 is a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 15 degree Fahrenheit for your superheat settings. And so we're trying to stay within that range when we're controlling a an evaporator with a case controller for a CO2 system. Yep. Yeah, and I've seen it recently myself where the transducer was reading really low which uh, translates into a really high superheat reading. So the evaporator will feed, uh, and it can even make temperature. Um, but in the meantime, it's probably letting too much liquid go through, yep. which um, ends up with too much liquid back at the rack, which can really make you scratch your head yep. um, and cause a lot of problems and set you back. So um, on the uh, pack controller... You want to um, look at the settings with that one and verify board points in the pack controller. And you want to verify that uh, the sensors are landed in the correct places. And that's going to save you time down the road. Um, as far as the transducers go, if you have the right transducer in the right spot, then you should have a good reading on it. But you just want to make sure that the transducers are correct because we use uh, 59 bar transducers on the low side on the rack and 159 bar on the high side. So um, having those in the right places is uh, is pretty important. You'd probably tie that and comment into the case controllers too, because yeah, you want to have the right transducer there, but also the setting in the case controller set up where you specify what your min and max transducer range is. So. Uh, yeah, yep, yep, because the case controllers default to... Uh, 174 pounds for a maximum transducer reading. Which is normal on the HFC side. We've got to switch that to 855 most of the time for the CO2 yep. transducers that are yep. used on those systems. The guys that like to be exact say 855.7. <laughs> so uh, that's what we go with. But uh, yeah, if you don't change that, then uh, things are going to be out of whack for, for sure. Flood back or yeah, yeah. super heat issues. Yep. yep. Every one of them has to be changed. Yep. So then uh, on the pack controller side... Yeah, if the uh, relays and the digital inputs and the analog outputs are assigned, um, you want to make sure that those points are there. And then you should be able to use the manual option, which is under I.O. status and manual in the pack controller. But you can use the manual option to make sure that they can move in the, the right direction. Um, sometimes you have to change a output voltage depending on your setup from 0 to 10 or 10 to 0 to get it to move in the right direction. But um, you can check all that ahead of time. And, um, yeah, and as they're charging up the system, then you would expect uh, pressures to to read, you know, compare them to gauges and stuff like that and make sure that we're where we should be. Yeah. Um, as far as superheat controllers go, um, it's fairly common to uh, run into superheat controllers, and some of those are valve drivers, but um, usually it's going to be one of our EKE-1As or an EKE-1C. We have some newer ones coming out, um, so probably this year we'll start to see some of those, I would think. Um, but uh, they're pretty common right now, is the EKE 1A and 1C. And these can be configured to do two different functions. Um, it's either one or the other, but it's either a superheat controller or it's a valve driver. And if it's a valve driver, it just accepts a DC voltage and then uh, steps a, a stepper valve accordingly. Whereas the superheat version, you're going to have temp sensor, pressure transducer, all that wired into it. Right, right. And usually you have to have a uh, external main switch of some kind too, yep. uh, which can be just a jumper wire if that's all you need. Yep. So, uh, yeah, you want to know if the EKE controllers are pre-programmed or if they're going to have to be programmed first. Um, I've seen, for the most part, the OEMs are pretty good about putting programming sheets in in the rack so you have some idea what they should be set to. You can, in theory, program the settings for it in the system manager and download to it like you would a case controller. It's just a matter of preference and where it was configured locally yep. or through that. Yep. Yeah, they, the, those, uh, at least the EKE-1C can be um, connected to the system manager with Modbus. Right, right. Yeah. Yep. 
Yep, so that you have uh, more visibility to it. And then, of course, um, it's considered a generic device for us. So the address that's in the EKE1C has to be different from any of the other case controllers or pack controllers. Yeah. And just a final few points here. I, back in the system manager side, we have our schedule section. Uh, you, you see all different uses for that. Defrost schedules is probably the most common one. Case lighting is a close second. Uh, but you, you want to review that section. Your defrost schedules that you have set up have to be assigned to specific case controllers. So make sure that's configured right or else your cases might not defrost. And then just the, the way that we see the systems being designed today, uh, we know if we go into a shutdown <clears throat> that we may not want to just bring everything right back on immediately. You'll have a lot of load quickly hitting the rack and the compressors. So usually what we see there is more of a staged approach where you'll bring the case controllers back online in groups. Um, so we use shutdown schedules in that, that same section of the system manager program that the defrosting would be. But we use the shutdown schedules so that we can group the case controllers and bring them back on with some delay in between each group. It could be five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever the, the design dictates. Uh, but you want to maybe look that section over and make sure you're you're familiar with it you see that it's there and also that the case controllers have been assigned there a lot of times if we are including that programming in the system manager we're not picking which case controllers go into which groups we usually leave that to be a, a field decision where someone in the field would pick and choose which case controllers tie into which which shutdown group and then the other thing would just be double check your your power if you have some sort of a, a um, surge protector. Uh, maybe there's something more significant than that with a, a backup generator. But I've seen with surge protectors, one side of it's just a power outlet; the other side of it, where the is where the battery backup actually is. Make sure you, you're plugged in for your controls power to the right side of that. If you have something like a, a surge protector in place, um, yeah, to, and then just tie that all up and you should be just about ready to go yep okay so that's our uh our brief list of uh checkout options you would have to go through before you're ready to uh, start it up so that when you can when you start it up you can just focus on um you know seeing how things are running yeah. and see if they're running according to the way you would expect the, the number of problems you're dealing with should be significantly less that way right right yeah yeah yep uh, the other thing that uh, we didn't talk about was uh, on the high side, you have a lot of safeties because of the, the pressure range of CO2 on that side. So mm -hmm. um, usually what I've seen is uh, everyone kind of gets on the same page so they know where the reliefs are set. Uh, they know where the compressors are going to turn off on high discharge. And then they also know what the pack controller is going to do uh, as the pressure would go up. Because, um, yeah, the pack controller is going to have settings in there that says, hey, if we get close to this, this setting, we're going to start bringing compressors back down and start turning things off. And then um, if we keep continuing to uh, increase, it will turn on all the gas cooler fans and things like that. Yeah, a little less hard cutoff points. Like we might have dealt with right. less of a pressure switch mentality and more of a yeah sophisticated, let's try to do some things to prevent from getting to that point yeah yeah co2 is all around us but we don't always like to add it to racks over and over <laughs> just because of problems so yep. it's something to avoid but i think people are getting better in general at kind of learning how to work with co2 now yeah it, it's something that couldn't be uh, everything's had to come up i think e equally it's the the availability of it when you've got to replace it in a store the knowledge of technicians the designs themselves from the oem level our controllers uh, i think it's all kind of coming up together and so yeah okay all right so uh chris let's um let's throw a weird question at you again uh, to see how you do on this this one's going to feel like a memory test probably we're not at a funeral for this one right? <laughs> no no funerals okay. for this one <laughs> but uh I yeah. feel like one after I'm done answering it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Here comes your own funeral. Uh so yeah, this is kind of a memory test, but um do you remember what the wire color combination is for the the transducer cable that we sell? If you'd like a hint, I can give you the colors. 
Give me the colors. <laughs> black, about, blue, uh, brown is what pops into my head. Black, blue, brown. That's right. <laughs> okay. I don't yeah. need the colors. Never mind. <laughs> that's, phase, you got phase one. I, I guess that. that one must have been devastating to me at some point because I got that one ingrained in my, my brain. That's right. <laughs> so which is which? What's the order? Yeah. Yeah. Which one is uh, plus five to power the transducer? Oh, geez. I was just going yeah. with the order. That was the order I had in my head. Which is which? <laughs> Uh, middle terminals, the crown, if I remember correctly, or at least I'm thinking of the 550. I don't know about a pack uh, of 55. Yeah. Oh, we'll just, we'll just yeah, take yeah, the, yeah, uh, yeah. let's take... go. Black is plus five. Okay. Blue, brown, blue is your ground or common and brown is your signal. Look at that. Yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. Nailed it. I was unconscious for a moment. What happened? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah, now that you're awake, you actually got that one right. <laughs> Good for you. There we go. Yeah. Redemption. I want to tell my kids about this when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> As you should. They'll say, why didn't you tell us about the other times you got them right? <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, well, listener mail is always available. If someone wants to uh, send us an email, they can uh, ask a good question or make a comment or whatever they like to do. And that's Controller Talk North America at danfoss.com. So thanks for listening. Our audio engineer is Raul Garcia. Mar Maria and the new guy, Josh, are still here making this happen. And we did hire another guy um, for uh, this time. He's going to be doing some leak detection work with us. You've probably heard of him. It's, his name's Justin Hale. So, uh, yeah, Justin Hale, Steve's brother. <laughs> yeah. Steve's other brother. Yeah. yeah. Dot Matrix's cousin, right? Yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. Well, it's her, his uh, nephew or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, that's an old uh, car talk joke from NPR. Okay. Justin Hale. They used to use him for testing exhaust systems. <laughs> Breathe yeah. deeply. Breathe gotta, deeply. Yeah, that's right. Got to go back and listen to those. They're classics. <laughs> All right, until next time, for Chris Brown, I'm Dave Yoder. Stay cool.